Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and uh, welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Julian Strange from uh, Bristol in UK, uh, one of the expert CTO operators from UK and Europe and the world. So Julian, thanks again for being with us today. Thank you very much for the invite and it's a great pleasure. Um, Julian, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you end up being the person you are? How did you learn CTOs, CTO interventions? How did you get your skills honed up to the level you have now? Okay, um, I've been thinking a little bit about this because it is difficult to work out when I started to become very interested. I think I was lucky at some points along my career where I had a colleague who was a bit senior to me who took me under his wing. Uh, He was still in training, um, but he was kind and helpful and supportive. Um, very sadly, he passed away from motor neuron disease, um, and he had a big impact, I think, on UK cardiology, and it's a shame that that was cut short so early. Um, his name was Dr. Akil Kapoor, um, who did the cardio study. Um, so he, at one point, moved uh, to a different center as a consultant and wanted help back because he was in an alien environment, and he asked me to come over. There was great training there, um, and that worked very well for me. Martin Rothman was there at the time. And I still remember doing a day with Martin Rothman. It was a waiting list initiative. I went in and he was sitting in the control room and we we're doing a list of angioplasties. He said, I'm going to give you the wrong bit of equipment for each of the cases that we're going to do. And then I'm going to talk you through how to manipulate that equipment and how to use it. And that moment of, I, I came away from it. It was half a day's work, but I was exhausted. And it was that mental challenge and physical challenge, which I just really enjoyed. So that's a bit of the background. Um, so the CTO bit, okay. Um, I thought I could do CTOs. Um, and I thought that was all right. And that was wire-based up until 2011, probably just a little bit before, 2011, 2012, at which point hybrid was introduced. And I met three very good, very good friends and very good colleagues, James Spratt, Colin Hanratty, and Simon Walsh. And uh, I think that was the first time that uh, in medicine, there were four, well, three other guys who were very like-minded, had fun, but worked hard and supported each other. Perfect. And how did you actually learn? Was it just doing things, watching cases? What was your pathway to learning? Yeah, so uh, watching and trying to understand how people were achieving success up until about 2011. And I think my six I don't know my success rate at that point and I didn't audit it but from the moment that hybrid and that algorithmic approach kicked in it transformed number one how I look at an angiogram I learned how to interpret what an angiogram was telling me and spend time looking at it thinking about strategies working out planning and then having the or learning the skill set to be able to do these things and you know, was that with specific people? Yes. I mean, myself, uh, James Spack came down to pop to me on uh, uh, Bridgepoint. Uh, those were qu- quite funny days. Um, and it was that acceleration of learning, which was addictive. And there was a moment when I went, oh, my goodness, how I've been practicing was so wrong. This is now safer, uh, more efficacious, better for patients, and actually we're getting good outcomes. And then actually, if you look what happened with the team, instead of them going, oh gosh, it's a CTO. It's a Friday afternoon. (laughs) What's Dr. Strange doing? It was like, wow, these are, the team suddenly became part of the process Uh, and and they enjoyed it. And actually you started to get people wanted to be in the room, wanted to learn, wanted to be involved. And I think it was, I learned at that point that getting different members of your team to help support the case actually was better for patients, made it more fun and was uh, a way that actually it didn't feel like we were working so hard or weren't struggling. And when I was stuck, 
they'd encourage, come on, you know, try this, try that. So, you know, everyone participated. It was fun. So did you do some special sessions for them to train them? Did you um, sit with them before the case? How did you actually get them to want to participate and be part of the case? Yeah, so, um, I mean, certainly the discussion before cases, uh, engaging with them, saying, right, this is what we're going to do. Um, we, uh, Optima, it wasn't Optima at that time, uh, taking teams to that. There was a great meeting in Barcelona, uh, sorry, not Barcelona, Madrid, uh, where we took some of the staff over and they realized, actually, we're doing this. It's not that amazing what this is all talking about. And they suddenly realized that they were unusual. We were an unusual center uh, doing complex, you know, challenging cases and doing them well. So I think getting the team involved, taking them along to educational meetings, getting them to feel as though they were involved with the whole process of learning as well. So we did you know, case-based discussions, in-house teaching and training. I had a very good specialist nurse who would help bring her team as well. It led for her being promoted and, uh, you know, that, that all helps. And what did you find to be the hardest thing to learn mm -hmm. in CTO and complex intervention? Difficult. Um, I don't think, hang on, I've got to think of something or else I'm going to sound as though it's all easy. It's not. <laughs> um, the, okay, verbalizing me saying what am i going to do and explaining why so that is a little bit about what i find the challenge so i feel as though my hands sometimes you know like that works i can deal with that and of course there are challenges you know how are we going to do this case what is the complexity what is the proximal cap issue uh, actually proximal cap is probably the worst everyone said oh just start with a you go back 2012 2013 <laughs> i'll just start that's the hardest bit, starting <laughs> off. is like, I can't do this. Scratch and go, oh, you know, I'm going to make a hole. Um, and then we have base. And wow. That, so it's all these little techniques that have come along and made the bits that actually were challenging. I think, I sort of remember thinking, actually, I'm the only one who finds this hard. <laughs> this proximal camp, everyone else is. Uh, we've all found it hard. But going back, the, the verbalization, the explaining why I've made that selection, I think I've learned how to do that better and that's helped me teach and train people to be able to understand what is the thought process that I've had that's led me to make those changes and that's probably made me a better operator as well. And how did you actually do that? Did you, it was just practice, uh, planning, how did you actually learn to verbalize? I got told off. <laughs> um, so we were doing a live case and I forget who was commentating and it was just, a, it was just, you know, what is useful is when you have friends who, uh, will be honest with you and say, listen, you, you're just doing stuff, but you're not telling us why. And I think it was James Spratt, uh, and you know, he enjoyed telling me, right. You don't express what you're doing properly. Think about it. And it does, it makes you question. It makes you think, oh, wait a minute. Okay. So you do need people who are supportive. Uh, nurturing, but also uh, uh, there to say, actually, there's always better. And you can say that to yourself, but it's also helpful when friends will say that to you as well. That's the challenge. Perfect. And then how do you prepare now? Is that different the way you prepare now than what you used to do before? Um, so I look at a film um, and um, it's interesting to see how other people plan. So some people will write stuff down, like this is what I'm going to do. This is the... I look at it and I let it sit there for, you know, if I'm going to do a list on Monday or Tuesday, I'll have a look at the films the week before. I've already seen them because I know the referrals coming through. Um, if they're an ad hoc case, we tend, if they, you know, I think I have changed a bit with it. I will sometimes take on ad hoc cases. We don't teach that, but, you know, you get to a level where actually I, I know that the risk and the challenges, we can always stop. Um, but with a complex, uh, you know, high-grade CTO, I, I let my mind work subconsciously. And when you then turn up on the day, you've thought about the different permutations and combinations of equipment, and, uh, your initial strategy. And when that starts to fail, what are you going to move on and through? So that's not a very helpful explanation, but I think if we say what is important, look at the film, work out what works for you, 
to help you have a very structured plan for at least the first one or two different parts of the algorithm, like what is my initial strategy? When that starts to fail, what's next? And then once you do more and more cases, you get experience, right, okay, this really is failing. I just need to transition and transition fast. Perfect. And uh, is that happening essentially? You literally sleeping on this? You look at the case and then just. Yeah. You know that old thing that you used to sleep on your textbooks and hope that some of the information, <laughs> yeah, well, I, it, that obviously doesn't work. Um, but there is, I think, it's how my mind works. I will subconsciously let it process. And I think actually, I, I, I don't think I'm that unusual. I think we all look at cases and, oh, uh, yeah, okay, I know what I'm going to do. And, and I think that's important, actually, because, you know, when we're faced, not just with CTO, but complex cases, some of the best things I've done is stop when I'm not sure and think, right, okay, I'm not going to take this all at the moment. That's not an admission of failure. That's just, there's something wrong that I don't feel comfortable with, and I'm going to step back at this process or step back now. The great advantages of percutaneous intervention, certainly radial, radial we can stop, we can bring that patient back and have a thought process. And it may just be for half a day or for a chat with colleagues or a discussion for an MDT or making sure that you have the right colleague who's free and available to join you and uh, that everything is set up. And that, I think, reduces complications. Great. Um, let me have you Sorry. Close, right? yep. um, how about the stress? I mean, you always... In life case, I mean, you look awfully calm and collected. <laughs> so is it a, a facade or I mean, are you really calm? Are you stressed? How do you actually feel when you're doing this case? Yeah, okay, so I worry. I worry about cases. I worry them at the beginning. I worry uh, maybe not so much through them. Um, I don't like failure. Um, but failure is fine as long as you have worked out why you're failing and maybe made a change to something so when you come back your success rate is going to be higher and we have data to support that you know a, a redo case that we've done and you've invested in and Anya is doing a study looking at this as well so we know that that process works so um i i definitely feel stress and, and, and I think it's ways of how you channel that and um, make sure that it is useful and effective and doesn't become overwhelming. You don't want to be blind and you can feel it with your team, actually. You, you can sense they know how you're feeling and um, they can sense when a situation isn't going well. And actually what you don't want is for that stress to impact on the team and their ability to perform. So... Some stress is useful, obviously, like all life. Too much stress is detrimental to that case, the outcome, and the team. And, it, and it's controlling that and working out why is it stressful, what is wrong, and obviously a live case, ooh, you know. But uh, you get to a point, actually, you can't have that much influence on things sometimes. Of course, you can do the best you possibly want or can, or but... This is part of the challenge of CTOs. It doesn't always work how you want. And that's useful learning for other people as well. Um, if it if a failure by me live helps someone learn, fine. That's the process. That's what we're doing. And I fail. That's allowed. And are there any cases that have stuck with you over the years, good or bad ones? Yeah. Um, uh, it was, I did a little um, three minute lightning thing on guide extensions. And I remember a case, it was in my first year as a consultant of a tortuous right coronary artery in a chat with aortic stenosis, who was going to have one of our first perk aortic valves. Uh, and it was a tortuous right, I think it was a French femoral that I went back then. And I didn't have a guide extension. They weren't available and I couldn't deliver equipment. And we had, uh, you know, just horrible calcified coronaries and I just I failed and I failed in a bad way and the patient had to go to surgery urgently and had a bad outcome and that uh made I, I hated that actually it it was a situation where I thought I could achieve something and it made it haunts me a bit I don't know whether I want to put this in <laughs> but it does haunt me it's horrible um, because actually, uh, you know, it, it was an opportunity. 
I think now looking back at it, we wouldn't think twice. And actually, I think it just showed where I was on my learning. I was the new consultant and actually who was saying it? Uh, gosh, I forget yesterday. This is a moment of perpetual learning. You get to your end of fellowships. That's what we're talking about. You get to the end of your fellowship. You think, oh, yes, I'm pretty good. Hmm. You've got a <laughs> long way to go. And we all have a long way to go. And whether that's actually taking on more complex cases or actually maybe not taking on such complex and crazy cases, actually that learning process is still there. And potentially, I think some of the biggest learning points is saying, no, this is not appropriate. That is... This, there's another way the medical therapy is very appropriate in this patient. Let's do that. That's probably safest. That's a learning point from a, a lot of what I've seen and done over the years. And then how about um, the physical aspects? Like, Do you get back pain with the lead and everything else? How do you handle the stress in the lab? Yeah, I cycle a lot um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was number one, very good for stress. Um, it's sort of, I mean, it's certainly cardiovascular fitness, but it didn't actually make me stronger to wear lids. Um, and actually what I've had to do is as I got older is do more weights, uh, yoga. Um, I, I sort of can stretch, but I don't do it as nearly as much as I should. Um, but I do a little bit of weight, core exercise, all of that is important. And I think it makes you feel more comfortable. Rampart, very useful. In the UK, we haven't been as brave or the regulations have, stopped us being so brave as what I see going on in America where people are shedding the lead, but it allows me to wear light leads. It takes a 10 kilogram set of leads that I normally wear. I can wear a four and a half kilogram set of leads on a split apron. I mean, it's, it's a different world. So that from a radiation protection, back pain, really helpful, keeping physically active and strong. I think that's useful. And I think it means that actually you don't feel physically tired during a case. And we don't do crazy long cases anymore. We're not stuck there. And I think the, the tools that we have have meant that we can get through cases. I mean, Tony Martini's case yesterday is very unusual. That was basically every single challenge that you could stack up in a case. <laughs> Calcium, poor access, poor guide, equipment failure, everything. And, um, you know, he was, what, three hours? And I think that's probably the longest case he's done for a long time. So... <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's, as you say, we've come a long way, and I think people now are more um, likely to invest and do something else when things are taking too long, because for safety reasons and for exhaustion reasons as yeah, well. You, get, you know, two hours. Two hours is a tipping point where actually you should be very close to completion, or let's think where we are. Look at the contrast, look at the radiation. So the people that you train, um, the trainees, the fellows, what do you look for in them? How can, can you tell like this person is going to be an amazing operator or is it unpredictable? Um, enthusiasm, uh, a willingness to learn, a willingness to listen. Um, and um, I think that those are the main things. And we, it's interesting. So some people have come through training and people say, oh, I can't teach them. They, they haven't got hands. That is, I think, a failure of the teacher. So I think it's, have they had the right opportunities? Have they been encouraged? Have they been given incremental steps? Right, okay, listen, you, you can't do a CTA. You can't go from here to being able to do this. You need to learn. Let's make this a little bit. Today, we're going to do knuckling. We're going to teach you how to do a knuckle walk. Right, you yeah. do that bit. Then we will go on to the next step. And I might, I'm going to take over just for the efficiency of the lab, but we're going to learn what this process is, why we're doing it. What are the challenges? So there's definitely um, uh, making learning uh, more structured, I think, is helpful. So you customize to every person's abilities. You can do now is the next step to yeah. learn and the next step to learn. And also walking out, leaving them, letting them. If you have a nice team who will say, well, come back <laughs> or just stop a minute, I think, you know. So the, if you have a good team who understand the process, they will allow this individual to have a bit more freedom. It gives me an opportunity to step out of the room and let them have a bit of freedom sure. to, okay, when you get stuck, let's have a discussion again. And then I, you know, I'm just around the corner I'm, or I'm peeking over around the corners to see what's going on, but not necessarily having to be there all the time. And it gives them a, 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 an, a an achievement or a, a responsibility that's important as well. Now, 
Are you more stressed out when you do your cases yourself or when you have a fellow doing the case? <laughs> the latter. Yeah. No, so I think there is a – there. it's interesting. So, I mean, I'm sure you find it the same. It is stressful. Uh, and, and, you know, how do you make that easier? You keep discussing and talking and making sure they're aware of what's going on. But it's also stressful for them. It's also probably a bit stressful for the patient at times. So you just need to make sure that they're aware of what's going on and – that were there but it, yeah. there's the, <laughs> i guess part of the reason why we're here and doing this stuff is that we uh, get frustrated and uh, our patience level is a little bit lower than maybe it should be at times so that's something that you have to learn and control now when it comes to um you know, saying in good shape, you say you exercise, you bike, you do some strength. Do you do anything else like meditation, writing, or anything like that, reading? Yeah, so I, uh, my wife's an uh, avid reader. She's not a medic um, and will throw books over at me and say, read this, read this. So I, I love friction, friction, <laughs> fiction, um, and I steal books of her. And so I, I enjoy that. Um, so meditation, I have done a little bit, but actually um, cycling is my meditation. So I will go off and disappear. So uh, we've got a house which is 200 kilometers away uh, on the Cornish coast, and I occasionally will cycle down to that, and it will take me a day. Oh. And do I come to the end of it having thought of amazing contributions to the world society and philosophy not a bit of it my my, <laughs> my mind goes blank and yeah of course you know you're thinking about different things but it, it's a moment of uh sort of tranquil calmness where actually i'm enjoying the exercise but i'm enjoying the outdoors and i'm enjoying in this moment where actually you don't have to you, people can't contact me i'm gone it's nice what is your favorite book and uh, movie if you have <laughs> Uh, um, so my favorite book is normally uh, the one I've just read, which is Act of Oblivion, um, which is a historical uh, uh, fiction, but um, it's about, uh, it's English history, actually. It's about the um, execution of one of our monarchs and how they escaped to New England. So I started reading it when I uh, came to Boston for um, the last TCT and uh, it's taking me a bit of time it's quite a big book but it's taking me a bit of time favourite films the one that still makes me laugh uh, and it's, this is it, Meet the Fockers I, I just I just saw something how many what is the film that you can watch four, five or six times and it still makes you laugh and it's that and it's just hilarious so there you go perfect so um, in terms of um the things that you've done, what are the things that you're most proud of? Um, I, I'm, I can be a bit gritty and I can be a bit determined and to get uh, the consultant post that I wanted. Uh, I was one of the moments, one of the, um, I went to medical school in Bristol and I you know, wasn't the most sensible medical student, but to come back and uh, set up the complex PCI, set up a heart attack service, a cardiac arrest service, some of the LV supported stuff. I've, I've really uh, enjoyed that. I've enjoyed uh, the team, watching them getting bigger, bringing colleagues in, um, our EP team expanding with a great colleague and friend from London who joined us. Um, I've that's it. I, I am proud of that, and I, and I and I enjoy it. I also think there's still work to do. We need to continue to build that team, and I need succession planning. I need people to take over and nudge me out of the way. That's that's what's important. <laughs> well, it's still too quite early for that, I guess. But <laughs> um, and then actually, so there was a, a clinical dean at the medical school who. Uh, um, was a little bit on my case when I wasn't doing so well in exams. And, you know, he was, no one particularly was that enamored by him. But actually what he did do is get us a lot of my, me and my friends and colleagues through medical school. And he came back to see me as a patient. And I saw his name on the list and he, he was still connected, but uh, he had bad angina. And as he came through the door, I shook his hand and I said, it was a pleasure to meet you. Uh, you see you again because the reason I'm here is because of 
you supporting and I probably didn't realize at the time but it was he was influential so it was lovely to be able to help him back it's a small world I guess yeah. right where it goes around comes yeah, around yeah. <laughs> and what excites you the most right now what are the things that you're most passionate about um uh -huh. <laughs> um uh, that's an interesting question um, Work-wise, work-related, I suppose. Either, you know, work and, and or uh, personal. Yeah. Um, I'm enjoying seeing my uh, grown-up kids actually uh, start, well, they're off to university and flourish and start to build their own careers. And that is uh, one of the most exciting things that I've seen for uh, a long while from a work perspective. There's challenges in the NHS at the moment, and it's hard to be optimistic um, and think that actually this is all going to work out well um i think one of the challenges and and uh does it excite me one of the biggest challenges is now making sure actually that we we set up a ongoing service that is caring for patients and uh despite some of the politics and politize politicizing of how or where I work, we need to make sure that we can still build a team and keep them going. I've lost a lot of my very good team members, a lot of our nurses, a lot of our staff, and I think that's a problem globally where you know there's been a degradation of teams that we've invested in and it's keeping that uh, enthusiasm. We are leaders and we need to act like that to make sure that we support the team as it transitions, as it changes and becomes more challenging for us. We just had to work out ways to make that make that happen and cope with it. There's a different stress. And what are your plans down the line? Are you planning to cut until you're 90 or? Yeah, I'm going to carry on. <laughs> I'm not stopping. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, yeah, you asked me a few years ago, I said, oh, I'm going to retire, I need to stop. No, actually, longevity. So I think we all have different stages in our career. Um, an area that I know I'm weaker on than, I sh uh, than others is research, but actually that's, you know, that maybe is the next chapter and, uh, you know, um, participating more in that, I think can be very rewarding as well. And I think, uh, you know, I've got a few more years and trying to work out uh, the best way to maintain longevity and enjoyment and the fun and the mental uh, stimulation, I think is important to making sure that we all keep going, keep going and enjoy ourselves, but also have a bit of time. And then I know that you've been, you know, phenomenal education with optimal all these uh, approaches, which have been phenomenal. You know, always the best light I see in the meetings are coming from you guys. Um, how has that impacted education? I mean, and for me, it makes things much easier. How does it? Uh, how does it work for you? Yeah. Okay. So actually, uh, having to write something down uh, makes you learn it, makes you understand the problems and the process, so you have to then work out right. If it's uh, if it doesn't make sense, if it's challenging and complicated, something's wrong, and you you should be able to break it all down into bite sized, manageable pieces where you can actually teach it. And there's very few things I think, or the the things that are very difficult are the bits that we don't know and we can't work out, and it's a challenge for everyone, and that's a good thing to confess. So. You know, James Spratt has got a phenomenal mind and uh, his ability to structure education has been a great influence on me and a great learning. And then what do you think is the best way for the fellows to learn? Is it through the books? Is it through the doing? Is it through a combination? What is the best way 2023 yeah, to okay. work on that? To understand how you learn. So as an individual, your learning is how you learn. So is it auditory? Is it kinetic? Is it by doing it? Is it visual? And if you can work out how you best learn and how you can best absorb information, you stop having the battle. Oh, I, I, I can't understand. I can't. It's because you haven't given yourself the space to learn the way that you learn quickest. So I'm very much more a kinetic learner. I'm a visual kinetic. So if I see and I can do that, that is much more uh, helpful for me. Uh, my wife's the opposite. She she needs to read and that, so it, it is interesting to see that process. So if you have to advise people, the ones who are early stage careers or the ones who con contemplate going into CTO complex, what would you tell them to do to be successful? Okay, um, spend time. 
so you give yourself time to watch and learn as well so that there's always an impatience and that's useful but get yourself involved in watching cases and actually that process of watching allows you to learn an awful lot more i think a lot of um when we were young uh at the very beginning we just wanted to do it so I wanted to, I, if i didn't get my hands on it's going to be it's, it's not it's a worthless case for me i think nowadays uh certainly just seeing and watching cases are coming to live meetings um but also doing some background reading making sure that you understand what has been discussed but being involved in cases listening to the discussions that are going on and piping up and asking questions and then um, when it comes to um, developing expertise when do you think is the time you say i've arrived i'm the expert now mm-hmm. uh, i don't know i'll tell you in a few years time so i think <laughs> um you know i can do this i think also i there is as many challenges now as there were um you know we we still have problems delivering uh the best uh outcomes for patients and you know we it's still quite extraordinary that we are having discussions which shouldn't have to occur you know we how many times have people how many times have i excellent angiography result written that in the in the but that doesn't matter it's actually right what is the metric that you can measure that actually tells you you've got a good angiography result so actually we're going to I'll go on the hobby horse use imaging so the msa in this patient was 10 mm square there was no edge to say we landed it it was well opposed blah 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 that's a good result just put those metrics down don't say don't just whitewash it or just say you know it was fine it looked great it wasn't that perfect everyone does that just put some metrics down and then it gives you a measure and it gives you a measure to perform and actually i forgot your question now but so i might go off on a tangent but order to yourself look at your own outcomes is powerful and it shows you oh gosh i'm a bit better than i thought or actually wait a minute i am vain in these cases repeatedly and then learn and 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 that's a bit brutal but it's a very useful process you know completely agree keeping it you know data base or participating on the register mm-hmm. it goes a long way to understand where you stand um but let's say that you know the problem with pci is that or you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow right i mean you do piano you know you can play the song 20,000 times you want to learn it but cto or any pci for that matter you don't know for sure so how do you get around from that that every patient is different and the challenges are different okay um i come from a musical background so um i think there's still challenges in playing playing a, an instrument you could say well yeah my my uh, sister's a, um, a, a professional violinist so you know she would turn around and say actually it's just as challenging the challenges are there they're real um so every case is different um yes that's absolutely true but actually if you look at what the disease process is it's very similar yes there's different outcomes there's different fingerprints that people have but actually the the basics of what we do and if we do those right and correct actually make that case much more understandable or much more achievable so i guess it goes back to why does a musician practice the same piece repeatedly to get the basics right so they can then perform why do we need to do cases and read and learn so we get the basics right and then we can perform well. And actually I don't know if you play a musical instrument but do you think that helps with yeah, with, yeah. I I do I I so I stopped but I played the violin up until the age of 18 and it means that actually I don't look at my hands. Uh I don't need to and I think that is I, I wonder if it's uh, unrecognized but I, I certainly when I see a screen I find it very easy just to do this because actually I don't have I see people looking I I think there is a, a bit of your brain that develops I started playing at the age of 3 or 4 um and so that that's I think gives you an automation which I think is useful. I think you're not the only one many people are playing instruments yeah. and they all say that it helps them. It's hard to quantify it yeah. but maybe I need to go back. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe do both. Yeah. You yeah, know yeah, the yeah. interventional cardiologist playing I, violin. I don't like the violin. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that cool and it still isn't. <laughs> powerful powerful though. Yeah yeah yeah, yeah true. Well, again, Julia, that was amazing. Um, lots of learning. Any parting thoughts, any things, uh, any advice you would have uh, just to finish up? Yeah, I think coronaries are uh, exciting. They are fun and they will remain challenging, fun and important. And yes, you can get distracted by 
Tavi and Mitral Clip and all of that or EP. But I think the real fun is within the coronary world. And I think actually it's going to continue. And I think there's still a lot we can do. And there's a lot that will happen and will develop. And it'll be interesting to look back in 10 years and say, gosh, wasn't that basic? <laughs> well, again, a few more years, we'll find out. But thank you so much. Pleasure. It was a phenomenal talking to you. And thanks for everything you've done. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 